And uh, we also liked that there are all these great official and community images. You don't have to reinvent the wheel unless you really want to. You can just say from Ruby, from Go, from Java, from Python, and you've got this environment that's pretty close to what you already need. And then you can crack it open on the registry and see exactly what their Docker file is, copy, paste it, tweak something, whatever you want to do. And then for uh, hosting choices, there uh, it's kind of funny to say there's pretty low lockage because you're getting locked into the, the Docker way. But at the same time, you can run your own registries. There's lots of people who are starting to support Docker. So the vendor that you pick, you're not particularly locked into. And a lot of this stuff you can run yourself if you have to. Um, so what, does, uh, what are our options for doing Docker CD? You can do CD in a lot of different ways. It doesn't always mean that you're just running it on some product that you picked. So the first way that you can do CD actually is completely off of your local machine. There's nothing really stopping you from saying, on my laptop, I'm going to run the tests, and then when they pass, I'm going to build the images, and then I'm going to push the images, and then I'm going to trigger my host to pull down that image. That's still CD, really. It's still shipping small pieces and uh, shipping it fast. And um, it's actually the simplest way to get started. The issue is that if you're running all this stuff on your little laptop, Hopefully you've got the, sort of the same environment as what you're looking at for um, production, and then also your, uh, I mean, at least my laptop, it's nice and light, but it's pretty slow, mm -hmm. and I'm on the Wi-Fi, and uh, when I'm working with other developers, who knows what somebody else might be doing on their laptop. So you've got these race conditions in terms of pushing and triggering deploys, because if I push my image and someone else pushes theirs, but then I deploy first, all of a sudden I'm deploying their code. So the second option is to look at hosted uh, continuous deployment with Docker. So in this case, um, let's say we just are talking about something pretty simple like Jenkins where you're, you're running it yourself. You've decided you're going to host it in the central location for your team. Uh, the issues that you have there are figuring out how to um, cache that information and actually leverage Docker's cache to clean all of your builds. And then making sure that when you're running all of this stuff in your containers that you do still have production carry. Because what often happens when you're running your CI is that your testing containers look a little bit different from what your production containers look like. So you still have to keep track of that yourself. And we talked about that a bunch in the open session yesterday. Um, then also when you're, you're building those production containers, um, how are you handling multiple containers? Um, and that sort of depends on which hosted one that you pick. But it was just a good thing to think about because there are a bunch of Docker-based CI solutions out there, uh, ones that you run yourself, open source ones, and um, uh, hosted SaaS products, where what they're doing with Docker is allowing you to use Docker to define your environment for your build, but not then letting you do Dockery things like building lots of stuff and running Compose and pushing images and all of that. So we wanted to make sure we had flexibility there. Um, and then with the host, it's similar to local where you're pushing your images up and you're triggering your uh, production environment to deploy. And then the third thing we considered was a custom solution because, I mean, we're developers. We can always consider a custom solution. Problem is, who knows what that is? It's whatever we feel like building. So um, that, can be, that can be anything. So what we really tried to focus on thinking about is what are we missing? What is it that we need that we're not getting right now? with what's available and out there for Docker continuous delivery. So we went to build a centralized continuous delivery system for our team, and these are the goals that we had in mind. Coming back to the same ones, that parity. That means that we wanted our CI containers to look a lot like our production containers. So that way we would know if the tests pass in CI, it's gonna be in the same environment when we go to production. In practice, this is approximately equal. We would try to get as close as possible, but they're always going to be a little different for good reasons. So one of the things we would try to do, though, is stick to the same from. Stick to that same base image and stick to the same OS packages, maybe add a couple more in test, um, and then also be linking our services. So I think the, the monolith container idea has been uh, declining, which I think is a good thing. Um, but at the time, we were 
you're trying to decide between do we want that big container that runs multiple processes under one init process, or do we want to do linked containers? And we realized that the linked containers was much closer to what production looks like, because you have your database over there, and you have your cache over there, and then here's my app. And it's the app that's coming in anew. And so keeping it linked means that the app container is just the app. And that's more similar to in CI to what you have in production. And then our hosting stack had to be Docker. So we can't do CI in Docker and then not deploy to Docker because then that parity is really destroyed. So this was sort of a, a clear one, but I wanted to point it out as well that sticking to that same host base uh, is, is pretty important. So then the other goal that we had was the orchestration. So that means running the tasks we have to run for CI and linking the services and keeping everything all <coughs> running and coordinated and being able to then collate logs, exit codes, all that stuff. So the first thing we looked at was Docker Compose because Compose does links for you and then it allows you to run a bunch of tasks. The, uh, so an, another goal here was, and something we were trying to figure out, was how to do multiple compositions. So being able to say, compose run my unit tests, compose run my integration tests, compose run my acceptance tests, have those configurations be similar but have different, uh, different goals and different dependencies. And the other goal that we had was that speed. Um, and for us, that meant the Docker cache. And speed really is critically important. I think if there's one thing that you feel uh, the most pain on when you're working with uh, continuous integration, it's when the build just gets slower and slower and slower and you cannot ship that one little one line change. It's like I spent five minutes making this change, it's taking me hours to get it to production and that really stinks. So we wanted to have a special focus on our speed. Okay, so talking about speed and caching, let's talk about base images. So it was important to be able to use the layers from last time, from the previous build. If those aren't present in the Docker environment, then you aren't able to leverage the Docker cache. So what that means for us, the way we thought about it was registries. It's a really natural way that Docker stores images and transfers them around, and the Docker registries all do this in a layered way, naturally. Our other goal towards speed is parallelism. We wanted to run a bunch of stuff at the same time. This is always really hard, uh, and we were not really sure what we were gonna do about this, but uh, we'll talk about it a little later. But the nice thing was we knew that when it came to parallelism, we had Docker's isolation. So when you run containers on Docker, you can run a whole bunch of the same thing, and they all get virtually mapped to different places, which meant that we at least knew we should, in theory, be able to run a bunch of stuff in parallel and have them not collide with each other, but that's always what you say at the beginning when you start doing something in parallel. So that meant that we needed the orchestration. We needed the orchestration of our linked applications <coughs> and their linked services and the tasks we were running. But then on top of that, we needed orchestration of orchestration because we had to parallelize Docker Compose. And when you're looking at one of your builds, you could have a lot of pipelines and a lot of nested pipelines. So in this case, we've got the checkout that happens at the beginning. And then maybe we have static analysis that might break into a couple different parallel tasks like linting, style checking, and security analysis. When we go to do our CI phase, we might have a couple different Docker builds, in this case A, B, and C, and then in here we've got like a bunch of different steps. These are like four unit test groups, three integration test groups, and two acceptance test groups. Then you go on to continuous deployment, and you might need to build production images and push and deploy those separately, and then collate that back together to pass your uh, your or build your deployment. And then what happens is, even if you look into just one of these, if you break one of them down, that acceptance test has got its own app, maybe an API that it uses, a database, the cache, and the tests. So this is what I mean by orchestration of orchestration. We've got all these pieces going on, and then each piece breaks down again into a couple of pieces. So it's quite complicated. And of course, since we're code chip, we were like, let's build it, because this is, uh, this is our product, this is what we do, and we were like, let's make this awesome. And uh, the alternate title for Let's Build It is what we learned and what went wrong. Um, so I'm hoping to uh, share a bunch of the things that we learned along the way, a bunch of the um, ways that we tackled some of these problems, and uh, also just to share some, some fun stories about trying to get Docker to work. 
Okay, so the first thing we knew we had to do to get one of our apps doing continuous delivery with Docker was to come up with what all of our containers looked like. So there's all these great official language containers, like I mentioned before, um, and I would say try to use them if you can. Um, they dictate the OS, it's, they love Debbie and Jesse, maybe it's because Jesse Frizzell likes to base things off of things named after her, I'm not sure. But Debian is great, but sometimes you're not on Debian. Debian. Also, they're big, and the pull is going to be slow, and they're going to use a lot of disk space, and uh, especially if you're um, virtualizing your Docker environment, like with Docker Machine and, uh, and VirtualBox, big images can get pretty painful when you're in development mode, and keeping development mode parity with CI uh, and then to production is pretty important. It also meant that for CI and while we're doing CD, when we had to pull these images down, uh, that could take a while, and then we have to push them over to our production environment, that took a while as well, and speed was pretty important to us. So containers for CI, when you're building these, the code changes a lot, right? Because that's the whole point of CI, is the only time you run a build is when the code changes. So the code pretty much always changes. And that means you're gonna have to be doing a lot of rebuilds all the time. And we found that our dependencies were the majority of time when we ran our container builds. And the dependencies only change occasionally. And by dependencies, I'm talking about your third-party libraries that you use in your application. So Maven, Bundler, PIP, NPM, all that stuff. So the first hack I wanted to share is layering dependencies. Um, this is one of the first things you sort of figure out when you start building your Docker images uh, to dodge this problem is that you can use Docker's cache in a particular way to be able to control when particular things get cached and the ordering in the Docker file matters a lot there. So uh, what we have here in the first section is the classic way you create your app inside of the container. You add doc, you add all of your source, and then you're gonna run your dependency thing. That might be a make task, it might be bundler, it could be maven, npm, pip, so on and so forth. And then your command is, to run my tests. So what layering means is you're gonna break that into separate ads. You're gonna add whatever your dependency manifest is. So in the first example here, that was uh, adding your go devs in, or adding your gem file in gemfile.lock, then run your dependency command, and then add the rest of your source in. And what happens is the add in the layered one is gonna be cached against the changes of those dependency manifest files. So if your dependency manifest doesn't change build by build, you can use the dependencies you installed from previous runs. So this is great on CI because it gets us boosted all the way through that phase and then we only have to do that real big build when we change our dependencies. So when you upgrade versions of libraries you depend on, you have to install them again. And it's really fantastic on a development machine because the development machines are usually a little less powerful than your CI machines, so this stuff takes even longer. Okay, hack number two, um, using registries for continuous integration. And we talked about this a little bit in the open session today, but I'll go into a little bit more detail today. So what, what, uh, what this means is that before I run my CI build, I'm gonna pull down the image for my app under the tag of the branch that I'm working on. So if this was a build for my feature branch, like feature uh, make the button green, I'd be pulling down app colon uh, make the button green, like with dashes, like a branch name. So that would be my build from my previous CI runs on that branch. So I'm gonna pull it before I run my CI build. And you might be thinking, where, where, where did it come from? The trick is that we're gonna push it after we run our build. So let's say you're building on master, right? And this isn't your, your very first master build. Your very first master build gets nothing. It has to build everything up from scratch. The second time you build on master, that first build pushed up all of your images to the registry under app master. The second build will go back and run the pull of app master, and it gets all the layers from the previous run. And they're just in Docker's var lib Docker as layers. It's not like you are explicitly telling Docker, use those images. You're not. You're just saying when you tell Docker to build, Docker's gonna go, oh, hey, look, this looks exactly the same, I'm gonna use it. Because that's why the Docker cache is awesome, is it's automatic. 
So we pull it before CI because after the last one, we pushed it up. And uh, the thing that I don't mention here is that one, one trick that we've added is that when you're doing the first build on a new branch, if you can't find the branch when you pull, we fall back to pulling master. So at least we get somewhat a pretty close sum, uh, pretty close layers. All right. And as part of this, running the, CI, running the registry near CI is really important. You can use the Docker Hub. Docker Hub is great. It's really easy because it's already there, but you don't have to. Docker's registry is open source. You can run it co-located with wherever you're doing your continuous integration. You can run it on AWS. You can run it on your own servers inside your, uh, your VPN or your network, whatever you've got in your VPC. Um, and if you wanted to, you could even run it on the CI machine right next to CI. You just might need to clean it up and watch your disk. So um, the containers that we're building here for production, it was a goal for us, like I mentioned before, to have them be the same as the CI, except maybe minus a few of my testing packages. So again, the layering in common bases helps here. So having your production containers and your CI containers really start from the same place and diverge much, much later means that the parity is better, but it also means you're, you're using all of those cache layers from when you were doing your CI build. So when you go to build your production container, you're leveraging your CI's cache. So really, if you set your layers up really nicely, a lot of things fall into place for you. So um, when you're actually deploying your containers to production, one of the issues we faced was that the bigger they were, the slower it would take us to get them from CI out to production. So you know, now we've got this magical environment, we've got CI, we've got a registry right there, our CI builds are running really fast, and then we go to run our deploy, and it just takes ages to ship it to where it actually needs to be. So one of the hacks we played with here was static containers. So what do I mean by a static container? I mean when you're running your CI, before you build your production container, you're gonna make some sort of production binary. Then when you build your production container, you're gonna build it in the current directory context, which means that binary is available. So when you build your production container, you can say, okay, I'm just gonna come from Debian, maybe I need a few dynamic libraries, I need CA certificates or, um, you know, some, I uh, can't think of a good dynamic library off the top of my head. Um, then you're gonna add that production binary in, into your container and your command will run it. So what this means is that that binary was not built by the container, it was built by you and then add it into the, into the container. So now what that means is that we only need the minimal number of packages to run our binary. It's the same sort of thing when you like curl a binary down from somebody and you didn't really need to build it yourself. You can just curl it down because they built you one for your architecture. That means we don't need any language packages. So over here, you don't know what language I wrote this in. In my dockerfile.production, I didn't have to say from Java, from Ruby, from, well, not Ruby in this case, like from Go or, uh, or C or something like that. Now, that only works for compiled languages, of course, so there's only a couple of those that uh, people are running most of the time, but there's certainly gains for a VM language, because for VM language, it's the same sort of thing, except you have to add one more package, you have to add the VM runtime, but not the SDK. So it's like a, using a JRE container and not a JDK container to run in production, and that's probably something that everybody who does Java is already like, well, yeah, of course you wouldn't put the JDK on your production system. That's silly. Why would you do that? But for us, when we were first working with uh, uh, this stuff, we were coming at it with Go, and uh, so we thought this was pretty neat. Okay, so hack number three, point A, was scratch containers, and these are just really, really fun, so I had to share. Uh, we don't do this anymore, uh, but it's very cool, and if you can get away with it, it's got some benefits. So what is the scratch container, it's actually just an empty tar. It is the Docker null container. So again, we're gonna make our production binary and we're gonna build it for production. But what we're gonna do is say from scratch, which means there is nothing in there. And we're gonna add our binary in and run it. So there's actually no, there's no OS. There are no libraries at all. And these are hilariously tiny. They are single digits megabytes. We've deployed six meg containers to production and run our services on them. And that's pretty cool. Um, the issue is it only works for languages that can statically compile fully. 
um, not even be dynamically linked to libraries available at runtime. And also, you have the worst CI to production parity. So we really sacrificed one of our goals for this, but you have a near instant push, pull, boot, and deploy. So if you've got a Go application um, and you're building it statically and you're shipping it out and then you're running it, that thing goes from being, hey, the build's done, let's deploy, to running in like four seconds. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, you had a question? Why is it the worst CI uh, process? Because in CI, you're not running a statically compiled binary against your tests, unless you are, and you could. Um, but in general, that's, you are. Yeah, so we use this, this model. Then go for it. Do and, and it goes through exactly like you said. Who's yeah. Who's yep. So if, if you take that statically compiled binary, and that's what you use to build up and then poke at with yeah. acceptance tests, yeah. then, uh, then you're doing okay. okay. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm talking more about, I guess I would think about it more with like unit tests, right? Where I'm like okay. unit testing inside the library and yeah. hitting against the uh, uh, test database and stuff. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I'm glad you brought it up because that's something you just have to be aware of and be paying attention to and realizing, hey, unless I'm actually testing the static binary I'm shipping, then I'm missing that parity. But awesome, that sounds really cool. Okay, so then we, we, we can't all do this magical static compiled stuff. Even at CodeShip, we've got some things that we can compile, and we've got some things that uh, are interpreted languages that we have to ship. So I wanted to talk about minimal guests. So a minimal guest is the base for a container, and it's the smallest OS that you really need to be able to set your container up. Minimal tool chain, minimal packaging, and a bunch of do-it-yourself. And these give you small containers for the more dynamic language crowd. So there's a really cool project called Alpine. Um, you, it's, it's like, I think it starts at like 12 megs or something like that, but it has a package manager. Um, the thing is though, as you bring in the packages that you need, that's really where a lot of the OS weight is anyways. But it's a pretty cool project and you can make some pretty small containers. So this is a 16 megabyte uh, MySQL client container from Alpine. And all you do is you say APK update and add the MySQL client, client. And now this container can interact with the already running MySQL database. And it's only 16 megs. So you can make these pretty small. Um, I'm hoping we have a lot more options. I think uh, it would be really great if we could take real OSs that are used in production, like Debian, CentOS, um, and strip those down even smaller. It would be amazing if somebody said, hey, there's a 30 meg Debian base you can use. I would love that. I think Debian's around 95 megs right now, which is still pretty good. And then one quick example here, if you want to take a look at what like a real one looks like, uh, we have one for Ruby, and we went from 718 megabytes with the official Ruby one down to 349 using Alpine. And Ruby, it's interpreted, it needs lots of libraries going on, so I wouldn't consider this small, but it's smaller. So there are gains that you can get uh, by using those minimal guests and really fine tuning this stuff. Okay, so let's talk about orchestration again and Docker Compose, because this is how we ended up uh, trying out um, how, how to run all of this stuff. And when you're using Docker Compose to run your tasks, uh, you end up having these separate services and you can link them together. So in this case, the application builds off the current directory using the Docker file. It's linked to this database. It's going to expose port 8000. And the database is just going to be an off-the-shelf Postgres. Now, if you want to run something in CI to run your tests here, you can say Docker Compose run app. That's the service. Then make test is the test command. And here, you can have the CI running with these linked services separated. Um, and this was really, really cool to get this up and running because it really felt like we had this powerful way of describing our CI infrastructure with a whole bunch of dependencies as well and getting that stuff to build on the fly. But we had a couple of problems. First one is, and this is still an outstanding issue, you can't really tell when those services are running. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit more in a second. The other one was environment encryption. So being able to have a safe way to share these environments, either it's within your company or with other companies, and keep your secrets secret during CI. Um, and then this comes back to the orchestration of orchestration. It was difficult for us to run a lot of composes all at the same time with services that were all named the same thing. So what happened was when we were building this, we ended up having to manually run and link it. 
So that means we would run a Postgres, we'd name it unit test group one's Postgres, and then we'd have to sleep for a magic number to wait for Postgres to come up. And then we would run and name our unit test group, link it to that unit one Postgres, make test, finish that up, check its exit code, and tear down uh, U1 Postgres. Um, although recently Docker has uh, is working on getting the Go project libcompose from the amazing rancher guys who are here. I don't know if they're here, but they're around, uh, which would make using Compose as a library a lot easier. Um, it's still in Python, so you still have to just call stuff to use it. Um, but we ended up having to do this, which was a little unfortunate. And then when it came to parallelism, that means you have to manually run and link these things and then namespace them inside of their parallel groups. So the orchestration of orchestration was getting to be quite a headache, which meant that you really have to run your own agent here to split the work, monitor all those containers, and at this point you've pretty much invented a hosting platform. So that was a big pain, um, but we'll figure it out. Okay, now the other cool thing we realized is Docker Swarm, the way that it works is it brings up a bunch of Docker machines, but it makes them look like one Docker machine, one endpoint. So that meant that we knew that if all we needed as a dependency for our CI was Docker, Swarm would give us machine parallelism for our CI builds at very, very little effort. And that was really cool, so we were really looking forward to this. Okay, so coming near the end here, let's talk about deployments. So there's a lot of different deployment styles. When you've finished up your CI part of your build, and it's time, you've got all these things built, all your images are ready to go, all of your tests pass, it's time to ship. So there's a couple different styles. There's the push the code up and build it on the host. Um, Deus has the ability to do it this way. Elastic Beanstalk is like this. This is like the Heroku git push and then uh, your deployment happens. The other one is where you build your images and you push your images up to a registry and then you trigger something on the host. Um, and Deus is in this list as well as Elastic Beanstalk, uh, Elastic Container Service, Google App Engine. You tell them, hey, go, go pull my thing, here's credentials, pull this image down, run it. And then the third one, uh, and I tossed this in just because Heroku's got this new um, Docker beta platform thing going on, which is um, they will take your images that you build and then cross build them into the Heroku slugs and push those up. So there's some other um, hosting providers out there that have just created these compatibility layers for Docker images that turn it into the artifact that they're used to using. Okay, so let's talk about building on the host. Um, that means that your CI doesn't have the burden of building your images. It means that your Deus cluster is gonna build your images. Um, for the most part, when I was looking at the solutions here, it had to be a single Dockerfile app, like Elastic Beanstalk. It says, if you wanna just push code, we're just gonna build whatever the Dockerfile is in the root. It's gotta be ready to go just like that, none of this crazy building a binary beforehand sort of stuff. Um, and it's gotta be, since it's that one service that's getting deployed, you only have that atomicity of a single service on your deployment. So you really have to just be able to deploy this thing in isolation. And you can't leverage the cache because you're over on some Elastic Beanstalk EC2 machine and you can't uh, manipulate the cache at that point. You can't do your pulls. If you're doing the build and then push and trigger pull, that means that um, you're on, uh, you have your local cache available. Your CI is gonna do those production builds for you. And the push and pull is gonna add time because you gotta ship that whole image across as opposed to shipping just your source and having it built wherever you are. But since we've been talking a lot about making those images small, that was uh, more appealing to us. And since you're in control at this point, you can push a lot of them, you can launch a lot of them together. And then build and cross build, I don't really know how all this works. I don't have a lot of experience on this one. I just wanted to mention it because I think a couple vendors are doing it and it seems pretty cool, especially if you're already using them. You can just say, ah, we can adopt Docker and then we can keep using the hosting provider we have and not make the ops people angry and just ship our stuff over and it'll get converted. Okay, so the fourth hack here is using the same registry like everywhere. So having that registry near your CI, but also having it near your hosting provider and pushing your CI layers, tagging them during the CI process, having them be available for CI nice and quick like we were talking about before. And then that means that your host, if it's already got your app and it's got your layers, only the layers that need to get shipped across to the host during the deploy are going to need to get shipped. And if that registry is also near the host, those 
pushes and pulls are very fast as well. So again, leveraging those layers really, really well so you have these really strong, slow changing bases and then the hot layers at the top that are changing a lot with a lot of churn. That means when you're going from CI into your registry, into deployment, only those top layers really have to move around and Docker takes care of all that for you, which is really cool. So trying to use similar bases here also makes a lot of sense. If you base all of your apps off the same core base, maybe the, all you mean by that is Debian or CentOS at a specific version. That means when all your services ship around, they're all using the same base. You don't have to pull a lot of big bases just to deploy one group of services. All right, so keep them close. And in our case, that meant just Amazon all the things. Okay, so what's next? Where are we going now that we've, we've set this stuff up? Some of the things we are really looking for and are still looking for is better parallel tooling around a lot of this stuff. And I think uh, it'll be interesting to see where Docker Compose and Docker Swarm go and if they're going to start working together, especially after the Tutum acquisition. There could be some neat things that they're working on there, but I don't know, it's all secret. I wear the shirt, but I literally, have, I have no inside information, so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but I'm hoping that, uh, that there's a lot more that's gonna come into play there as they grow and they start tackling bigger problems around the, the parallelism tooling. And then also, I'm hoping for some better development environments. Running Docker inside a VM is pretty difficult, and I'm hoping we get some non-virtualized uh, Docker drivers for more and more platforms. I know Microsoft's working on that, having one native, um, and then uh, on OS X, that's still, uh, still difficult as well. And then machine provisioning. So when we're actually building up our CI machines, we do this immutably. And so we want to be able to boot up a machine that is running Docker so we can start our CI build on it. And Docker machine right now isn't a really a production tool. It's more a development tool or um, when you're working through the tutorials, when you're setting up those systems, they tell you, yeah, you probably shouldn't be using this in production just yet. And it's also, again, it's, it doesn't have an API and it's in Python, so you can't, uh, unless you're in Python, you can't um, leverage it in any way. And even at that point, the code there is um, library oriented, not API oriented. Or I'm sorry, no, Docker Machine is in Go. Docker Machine's in Go, but they don't have it architected in Go in a way that you can use it as a library. It's just meant to be a CLI. But uh, I think that might uh, be an area where they're gonna be improving as well to help people get this stuff running in production. That helps with CI too. Okay, so last thing I'm gonna plug is that we have been working on this stuff for a long time and it's not generally available just yet, um, but it's not in beta either. Um, so you can check it out there on uh, CodeShip's site, or you can just come say hi to me and we can talk about it. Uh, we've been running this for ourselves and a couple of uh, big customers for a little while, um, and uh, I'm happy to share more information about that with you, but didn't want to just, you know, sales pitch you for 45 minutes. All right, thank you very much. So I believe we have five minutes for questions, and I also wanted to share a little coupon code for, for CodeShip, um, so we're really happy that you all came out to Container Days, and uh, if you want to take a little, little coupon off your, your code should build NYC Container Days 2015. Um, yeah, questions? Yes. Uh, so the last slide you had on the uh, provisioning bit, uh, <coughs> you see people using alternative tools like uh, Ansible or Vagrant, uh, things that maybe are a little bit better tool to actually provision resources? Yeah, exactly, and that's what we do. Um, I think it would be really nice from the parity perspective to be able to say, oh, you just got it started learning Docker. Use Docker Machine, it's the easiest way to get going. Okay, cool, you figured that out. Let's get your app running on CI. Guess what, we use Docker Machine, which means if it worked for you, it works for us on CI. Okay, cool, now let's deploy it. Well, we use Docker Machine for deployment. If it worked on, for your machine and it worked on CI, then it's gonna work in production. So being able to use the same thing uh, is, is very useful there. So uh, if you're using Ansible for development against the Vagrant box, then you're using Ansible for your CI provisioning, then you use Ansible for production, then, then you've done it. So I think that would be a great way to do it. Um, it would just be nice if the first party Docker machine had the ability to extend all the way through the stack, it was my main point there. Um, but yeah, using one tool through the whole stack is, uh, is very powerful. Thanks. The latest Alpine, by the way, is five minutes.
Wow. See, the thing with Alpine is the, the latest is really small, but as soon as you start installing stuff, you kind of creep up to where um, you were going to be anyways. Yeah. Um, this is for you to give away. The tile? Yes. Okay. All right. Who else has got a question? <laughs> yes. Um, you mentioned that if uh, you're on a new branch, uh, you want to you know, pull down uh, from master so that you don't have to rebuild that branch from scratch, right? So, uh, why don't yep. you pull down necessarily from the parent branch? What if the branch parent is not your master? Uh, yeah, yeah. You can do that too. Okay. Um, the, the, the trick. Um, so the trick is that we did this outside of the checkout. So at the time where we did the pulls and pushes, that was pre-code checkout. So we didn't have Git available to be aware of where, who our parents uh, were. Okay. That, was, that was all. Um, but generally, like unless you've got some really long branches going, if you've done your layers pretty well, the master's going to have a lot of that stuff. Right. It's just if you start really getting off into the weeds with some really big updates your dependencies, but again, it's only that first time there's a new branch, you have to suck it up. So and every time you just upload the image back and scrap that image. Exactly, yeah, once you've done that first one, you're good. And um, and at CodeShip, it just happened that internally, we often open the branches and open the pull requests pretty early so that we can start reviews and get feedback on the work we're doing before we're done, when we're at the beginning. So you end up opening these things that uh, you know the build's going to fail because you really just started on it, and you just sort of let it go and, and build up so it's ready. And then as you work along, um, it gets a little closer to where you want to be. Yeah, I know, know a lot of those first builds that way. Just yeah. Working at it. Yeah, I mean, and sometimes you just check it out to make the branch, and then you push it, and nothing really changed, but you just sort of got everything going, and you open the PR, you talk about what your goals are, what you're going to do with it, you have the discussion with your teammates about your different solutions, and for us, that's a communication point. So we try to do that along the way. Yeah. Thanks, you just want to file. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if your um, CI machines get really, really, really filled up with Docker images. They're immutable. You may be totally done with and don't need them anymore. Our CI machines are immutable. So we, we launch them per build and we terminate them per build. Um, and that's also because we. Um, uh, we provide full root access on the machine and give you privileged Docker so that you can run Docker stuff while you're inside a Docker build. So um, in order to give that much power with the security concerns with Docker right now, I mean, I don't know if there are still existing security issues, but I'm not a security ex expert. <laughs> so uh, we just have our machines terminated afterwards. So we use the registries as the place to keep all of those images around, and we let Docker deal with that. Um, we haven't started using a co-located registry for our CI uh, product yet. We're hoping to use the Amazon first party one. We used it for a little while while we were working on it, um, <laughs> but then we ended up transitioning over to using a hosted one, but now we're feeling a lot of pain from using a hosted one and we want to move it back for a lot of the reasons that I talked about. And so we've been going back and forth and, uh, and yeah, but uh, that probably will become an issue. But like I said, I'm hoping we can use Amazon's registry product because I'm hoping it's going to hit GA pretty soon. Um, that'd be nice. But regardless of if you run it yourself or if it's hosted, it's going to get filled up with yep. lots and lots of stuff. Yep. So the nice thing is because we, the way we structured our tags um, with the branch name, with the app name, that means that once we've got those, uh, we, we can clean out everything that's not needed by the current tags because the, we don't need those old untag layers anymore. And since we're re-tagging with those, those branch names, um, it helps us keep that, uh, keep that in check, I guess. But uh, then, yeah, you would still have to go back and clear out the branches when they got merged in. Um, but we don't have a solution for that yet. Um, all right, well, that's it for me. If you have any other questions or you want to talk about code chip Docker or just cool testing stuff, um, stupid Docker tricks, I always love those. Um, just come say hi. Thank you.